watch over your coming and going. I have just one brief thought, and I don't exactly know how it applies to what we just were thinking about, but in the realm of human experience, so there's two things, right? There's a relationship to God and a relationship to others. And I've been watching our chickens in the back garden. Um, we had two, and one died, and so then we got three more, so now there's just one old hand and there's these three newbies. And you would think that they would be okay, there's only four of us in the world as far as we're concerned, we should get on. But we don't do that. We, we peck at each other. And even if you're at the bottom of the pack, if, if you figure out a way to peck someone else, you'll do that. But no matter how mean everyone else is to you, you don't take a lesson and say, oh, I should therefore be kind, but it's not me being that. No, you also be mean, just like the dog eat dog or chicken eat chicken, that, that sort of thing. And I thought about that, and I thought how often I've been like that chicken. I'm not quite as stupid. But, <laughs> you know, I, people do things to me, they hurt me, and I'm like, that, that wasn't nice, they, they really shouldn't have, they shouldn't have done that, they should have been kinder, they should have been this, they should have been that, I've always suggested for someone else. And then, there I go sometimes. So, what I guess what I'm saying is, as I think about a relationship with others, let's not go to chicken. Um, that's what I learned from my chicken this week, or we've been watching them get along, so... <laughs> God bless you with that. Uh, we're going to turn over the service now to um, Paul, who I, has a prayer, I guess, and then and also an answer. So God bless you, Paul. Pray, mighty God, that you would 
burn up what is left of the pride that's in us that separates us from you and Lord still prevents us from seeing the full glory of your kingdom. We pray that you would do these things so that Jesus be exalted amongst us, that he be lifted up in our hearts and our minds and our lives. Lord, we pray for those who still walk in darkness, Lord. We see this world and how many, Lord, refuse your grace and your offer of salvation. Or how many never hear of it. We pray for your church, Lord. We pray for those who proclaim your word. Pray that you would give them power and strength, Lord God. You would come to their aid for the sake of your people. We say, please, come, Holy Spirit. Give words, Lord God. Words that produce light. Ignite them by faith, Lord God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, which you alone can give. We thank you that you declare that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Lord, we pray for a fresh anointing, a fresh outpouring of your Spirit upon us, that we might live in a way that is the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. Amen. Jolly good, right. Here is a, a reading which some will be familiar with. It's from Luke's Gospel. And we remember that the Apostle Paul said, Jesus Christ came into the world. He came for a purpose. And it says he came to save sinners. So it is good news for sinners. If you're not a sinner, he didn't come to save you. Right? He came into the world to save sinners. What a splendid thing that is. And here's a demonstration of the grace of mighty God in this. It's called the parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach for the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and against heaven. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. There are some that say religion is a mechanism through which people are controlled. And there's no doubt that the church, amongst others, has used the uh, gospel in a way to control people. For example,
example, the Roman Catholic Church refused to allow the Gospels to be translated from Latin into English. And uh, that was ostensibly so that they could have complete authority, because if you don't know what it says, how can you argue with them? And they maintained that position for a lengthy period of time. And men gave their lives, sacrificed themselves. Tyndale, who translated the New Testament into English, was hunted down and burned. There was a time in this country where if you were found with a Bible in English, your life was in danger. Satan has many strategies. Isn't it remarkable? One time, your life would be in danger for just having a Bible. Now, there are many Bibles. You can go to a car boot sale and somebody won't pay two quid for one. Staggering, isn't it? Really. So the idea that um, God is this control freak who's just going to utilize his authority to put in positions on people and make them like prisoners is completely untrue. And what we have here is the picture of God as a father. And to be honest, I think that you would say that if there was a father that's portrayed here as God is, you would call him irresponsible. For what father in his right mind, having two sons, had the younger one come to him and say, Father, give me my share of the estate. You think the father didn't know what he intended to do? You think the father thought he had a sensible plan, an investment strategy? You think the father thought the son is going to go away and responsibly use this to expand the kingdom? No, he knew all along. God does not take prisoners because people are already prisoners to sin. He has come to set them free. And he allows them to exercise their so-called freedom in sin to reveal to them that they're really prisoners. <coughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> this account is really accurate and applies to me and other people I know. This business of receiving what God has given us and using it to indulge our sinful nature. You see, you might think, or somebody might say, that the talents, the gifts that they have, their abilities, were somehow self-generated. I don't see how that makes any sense. Uh, for example, I used to like, I still do like playing tennis, but if I had trained my entire life, I would never have got to Wimbledon. I would never have beaten Roger Federer. Or perhaps a, you know, someone who's number 1,000 in the world. God gives gifts to people as he sees fit. And he gives them not so that we might indulge ourselves with them, but so that we might bring glory to him. But our hearts are so inclined and so rebellious against the giver that we use them in order to glorify ourselves. When I was a young man, I uh, indulged in criminal behavior. At last, something interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was involved in conspiring, they said, to defraud the banks. Thought you might get no need for that, but you know. <laughs> They've been defrauding us for years. Anyway, I had a friend who was also charged with the same crime. And he and I had something in common with John Bunyan. That is, we both spent some time in Bedford Jail. <laughs> I also preached in one of uh, John Bunyan's old churches, but when John Bunyan went to jail, he went to jail for preaching the gospel. We went to jail for stealing money from banks. And they've made progress since the time John Bunyan was in jail, because what used to be a single cell now housed three people. And 
there was a bunk bed and a bed on one side and you couldn't pass between the two at the same time. There was so little space. There were no toilet facilities, you had a basin which you did whatever you had to do in, which you emptied in the morning. And um, this was not a very pleasant arrangement. I can remember actually, I was on the top bunk and with the window was slightly open, there was obviously bars on the other side to prevent those who had any initiative. Uh, people would empty their pots out of the top window and you'd get a spray cut through. <laughs> most wonderful. And um, this is what I spent my ability on, my talent on. And uh, I wandered and went off to a distant land and stayed there for quite a long time. And it is a distant land, it's far from God, but you don't have to be a criminal to do that. We're told here that he squandered the wealth, his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. You see, when you're young, you have a sense of immortality. It's an incredible thing. I don't know. I don't know if anyone remembers it here. <laughs> I have a vague recollection of that. This tremendous sense of immortality. And this tremendous sense of life that used to run through you. But as you keep going down the road, the return that you're getting for your investment becomes less and less. This man went off and squandered his wealth and wild living. It says later on that he spent his money with prostitutes, not alcohol. And no doubt, people thought it was wonderful because he had a lot of money to spend. That's the way to get friends. And they would stick around, pay each other on the back, things are going well. And the amazing thing about immortal youth is you have no idea that it's going to be stolen from you. You're too dumb to see that. You don't see anything. You don't see yourself getting old. You don't see death. You don't see any of those things. They are hidden from your eyes. You imagine you're going to be forever young and forever fun. But God in his grace has set a clock. And you know, in the times before Noah, people used to live seven, eight, nine hundred years. God got bored of that because you wouldn't learn if you lived to be a thousand, you'd be the same person. You really would. Nothing would change. So God reduced the age to 80, 70, 80 years. And I can remember when I was 20-something, early 20s, I thought no self-respecting person would want to live beyond 30. <laughs> they didn't want to do that. What's wrong with them? They might as well be dead. I mean, 40, that's ridiculous, isn't it? I'm going to see Mick Jagger being asked when he was in his 20s what he'd be doing his 30s. He said, certainly not this. That would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? Can you imagine? There he is, 78, still strutting away, strutting around like a, like a strutting around Big Jagger, I guess. <laughs> what is that about? Nobody ever sees anything. Delusion is amazing. And revelation is something that sometimes comes through pain and difficulty. God loved this boy, it was his son. And I'm always... I suppose not so much anymore. I've got another friend who we used to think, well, by the time we're 30, we'll be millionaires. You get to 30, oh, that's that. But all right, 40 then. Or 35 to 40. Somewhere around there, it'll definitely be happy. 40 ain't happy. Oh, dear. That's all right. Still got plenty of time. 50 then, at the outside. 50 comes and goes. No, now like me, he's over 60. Now where'd you go? The window is closing and nobody sees or recognizes. You're spending all you have without getting any wiser. It's astounding. And you would think that this guy who's been sent off with wealth would see it disappearing and start asking the question, what am I going to do when it's all gone? But if you're like me, 
you're the sort of man who jump out the top floor with a parachute and decide not to pull the ripcord to see what happens when you hit the ground. It's a bizarre thing. Self-destruct. It's woven into your nature and is an ally of Satan and a demonstration of the reality of his existence and his power over you. Because if it was about reason, people would stop. Have you ever been, I've been to old people's homes and spoken to people. And I'm always amazed. I'm amazed because there they are, teetering on the edge of their existence. Now you would think, wouldn't you, that if there was any rationale, they have nothing to lose by putting their faith in Christ and everything to gain. They're not exactly off to Monaco the next day with a bag of cocaine, are they? Just wandering in wild living, they've done all that. So why don't they come to Christ now? Why don't they? Because there is an authority and power which is preventing them. And the kingdom of God is not just about talk, it's about power. It's about the power of God because it's only the power of God that will transform anybody. Consider your greatest enemy, my greatest enemy, and your greatest enemy till the day you die is pride. Look what happens to this guy, right? Once he's spent everything, there's a double whack. Because even if his friends would have felt inclined maybe to help him, God sends a famine. So that now, even if they wanted to, there was no opportunity because everyone's up against it. This famine here is described as a famine of a, 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 a material kind. <clears throat> but there's also spiritual famine, isn't there? I mean, I don't know about you, but it seems to me the older people get, the more obdurate they look, the non Christians, I mean. You can see that death has got grip on them. There's no joy. Is there? How many joyous old people do you know? They're all cheesed off because they're old. Of course they are. I would be. You know? Well, I am old, but <laughs> depends on how you look at it. The, the point being is that <coughs> what is being stripped and taken from you is that glory of youth which has disappeared. Now you, you then try to fill that vacuum with something else. Now the something else doesn't work anymore. And at the end of the day, you're a dried up husk. That's what happens. That's the reality. Unless God is pouring his spirit, his joy, his peace, his love, what, what are you going to substitute it for? People take drugs, drink alcohol. Why? Because they're looking to alter their state of mind. They're looking for peace. They're looking for joy. They're looking for some different sense of consciousness because that is what they were created for. But only God can really supply it. Because anybody who's taken drugs knows there is a diminishing return. The person becomes addicted. And then after a while, that feeling of euphoria starts to wear off, grow thin, and now they're just trapped. This is how Satan lays hold of people. And it is grace, it is grace when God brings disaster. It is written, God does not willingly bring disaster upon the sons of men. But when he sees them walking towards the edge of the cliff, refusing to stop, go back, turn round, he has to take extraordinary measures. And that's what happened with this guy. Now, here's the thing. Here he is. This dreadful stuff has happened to him. Now he's got nothing. Pride stops him from returning to his father. He would rather go and feed pigs. How many people? would rather do anything else, try anything else, than turn to God. 
Do you know what it is? I'm telling you, it's pride. And it's the power of Satan. And Satan is real. And he has real power and authority over people. And he longed to fill his stomach with what the pigs were eating, but of course he couldn't digest it. And then there's this tremendous verse, this tremendous verse. When he came to his senses. What do you think brings people to their senses? I tell you what it isn't. It isn't reason. People don't get to that point where they think, do you know what, this is madness. No, they keep going on. And the greatest example of the grace of God, in, in my estimation, and the manifestation of only God can bring people to their senses is the tale of the story of the historical fact of the two criminals that were crucified either side of Christ. Now, sometimes people say the Bible contradicts itself. And in Matthew and Mark, the account of the crucifixion has both criminals calling down insults upon Christ. Imagine the scene. There you are in extreme agony. You're dying. There's this other brutalized man next to you, strict naked, beaten beyond belief, also dying. And at the foot of the cross, there are a bunch of mockers and scoffing, mocking the one in the middle. And you're doing the same. But in Luke's Gospel, it says that one of them rebuked the other one. Is this a contradiction then? Saying, don't you fear God, we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. What tremendous kind of demonstration of conversion that is. What, what happened there? What happened? Is this a contradiction? Isn't it astounding? Don't you think this is astounding? Consider this. This is God pouring his wrath out on his son for what I've done, for my lousy, stinking sins. He's now carrying them. Imagine being the father who has not rescued the son from Gethsemane when he's pleading, if it's possible. Imagine being the father, seeing your son being brutalized and crucified and one, two of them next to him calling down insults themselves. What would your inclination be? My inclination would not be to open one of their eyes when he came to his senses. Who could have opened that criminal's eyes at that juncture but God alone? And who could have given the criminal the ability to see he was getting what he deserved and that Christ had done nothing wrong? And who could have given him the eyes to see that this battered man is coming into a kingdom. How did he see that? The living God opened his eyes. Do you know what the gospel says? It says that this happened so that in the coming age, the incomparable riches of his grace might be seen in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. That man went to glory and he never did one good thing. He died a criminal. All he did was confess, declare the righteousness of God and ask for When the man came to his senses, you see how many people have got a partial vision of who God is. Even this man who is a son, now he squandered everything. It's going to be kind of tough to go back, isn't it? He left home wearing the finest clothes, fully bundled and full of himself. Now he's starving, dressed in rags and smelling of pigs. Animals which were not to be associated with if you were a Jew. 
And yet, he's got some inkling. He came to his senses. God starts to open his eyes because he realizes and he says, what am I doing? He says this, how many of my fathers hired men, had food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. How many of us do consider ourselves to be like one of God's hired men? How many of us have been deceived into going back into that position where you imagine that having received salvation as a free gift of God, you're now going to have to earn it? There are now things you're going to have to do. Make me like one of your hired men. It is not that there is nothing we have to do, it is the attitude with which we do it. If we do it with praise and thanksgiving, then we will be operating in the power of the Spirit. I don't, can't do anything, I can't add to the finished work of Christ. That's the great temptation of Satan. And do you know what it's saying? It's saying that the cross is not enough. That what Christ completed is not enough. Now you have to do something. You don't have to do anything to earn it because you can't earn it because that would be an insult to the blood of Jesus. So therefore, let us do whatever we do with thanksgiving and joy. Because do you know what you're saved for? You're saved to praise God for the glory of His grace to you. Hallelujah. That's an extraordinary thing. And the man sets out. And it was only because of the cross that he's able to return. It's only because the debt's already paid before he sets one foot in front of the other. Because Christ is already all that sin that he's been committing. And the father who gave his son because he so loved those he came to save, sees him whilst he's a long way off. He's coming from a distant land, he hasn't got any good works, he's got nothing to recommend himself to God the Father for. Nothing. The father sees him full of compassion. How about that? If it was me, I'd be looking down the road to see my son coming back. Sure I would. But when I saw him in the distance, I wouldn't be running to him. I'd be going back into the house. Thinking, you know what? I want to hear what he's got to say when he gets back. I want an explanation. I mean, for goodness sake, boy. <laughs> Didn't you realize, having spent half of it, this isn't going to end well? How did you manage to plow on and churn all of it? Yeah, get right, you'd be like the hired man, you start now. <laughs> this isn't who God is. <laughs> Seeing him, he runs to him, throws his arms around him. And, and, and the boy starts, maybe he's a man, starts trying to give this explanation, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Make me like one of your hired men. He says, quick, forget that. Quick, get the best robe. Quick, it's not, it's not, oh, well, let's wait and see how reformed he is. <laughs> it's not that. Because the best robe is the righteousness of Christ. It's like Lazarus when he comes out of the tomb. Take off the grave clothes. Take off the old life. Put on the new life, the righteousness of Jesus. The reality of it. The sheer glory of it. I mean, I sometimes am staggered by the proposition that we have been created to become like God. And I'll tell you something. I, I woke up the other night. I, I was having this dream. And one of it was a nightmare. I've been caught with doing 110 in the 30, John. You all see that. <laughs> Thank goodness it wasn't true. <laughs> and then uh, the other thing that came to me was this. That's the white stone in Revelation. 
And you know what? It was a little revelation to me. Because it says that you will be given a white stone with a new name written on it that only you know. How about that? You know what? That just amazed me. Because then I saw, then I saw this reality that your relationship with Christ is one-to-one -one intimacy. That is why you're given a new name, known only to you by him, because he knows you completely, and he would have died just for you. One day you will look at him, and you will see him. That is true. That is true. He would have come just for you, for me. How astounding is that? Oh God, Lord Jesus, help me to take it in. Holy Spirit, pour out these realities so that we might realize and know. And you know the glorious thing is, he says, this son of mine was dead. He didn't cease to be a son whilst he was squandering the possessions that the Lord God, the Father, had given him. You know, Jesus came to say, if I fully convinced of this, a people that the Father knows, because that's what Jesus says. Father, they were yours. You gave them to me. That's a staggering thing. God knows who he came to save. Hallelujah. They were yours gave them to me. To the Jews, whilst he's walking through Solomon's colonnade, they say, tell us plainly if you are the Christ. I did tell you that you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. The Father who has given them to me. This is the thing. <laughs> do you think, do you imagine that God is going to lose, Christ is going to lose a single person that Jesus has come to deliver, that the Father has given him. That's why it says at the end of John's Gospel, after the arrest, when all the rest flee, this was to fulfill what he said. Father, I have lost none of those you have given me. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Everyone given to the, Father, the Son by the Father will be saved. Hallelujah. And all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And all who look to Christ will be saved. And the command is, look to me. How could it be any easier than that? How could Christ have made it any easier than look? Look to him who loved you and gave himself for you. Just as Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. The snake represents the serpent. He became sin. He was made to be sin for you. Believe this. Do not believe the liar. Do not believe the liar who tries to keep telling you that you are not good enough. You haven't done enough. He's a liar from the beginning. And he will be a liar to the end. Christ is enough. The last thing I'm going to say is this. Jesus on the cross said this word, tetelestai. It's a Greek word. It means it is finished. And it was used for three purposes. One was that if you were in debt, you owed taxes, business debt, whatever it was, the, the, the receipt was stamped with the word tetelestai, paid in full. Paid in full. If you had committed a crime and you were sentenced, when your sentence had been fully served, it was stamped tetelestai, paid in full. Hallelujah. When there was a battle and victory had been won, it was declared tetelestai, the battle of victory has been fully won. The debt fully paid, the sentence fully served, the victory fully won. And it is in the word of God that we stand upon his promises. 
against all the power of the enemy, no one will ever be able to defeat those who stand in the word and upon the word of God. us, Lord, when we have doubted it, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, when we have allowed the enemy to intrude 